Good afternoon to all. Uh, my dear friends, here we have uh, with us uh, Professor Ganesh Narendas Devi. He needs no introduction. He is one of the makers of modern India. And he is a very erudite scholar. And he has contributed significantly in the area of linguistics, literature, in the area of tribal studies, and so many other fields. Here I would like to ask few questions to sir so that his expertise may enlighten our minds with insightful thoughts. Sir, the first question to you. How was your experience of interaction with our SES students in the morning, sir? Super. Extraordinary. I had not expected such good questions from them. I was delighted that uh, they took a great interest in what I was saying and they had uh, very uh, alert questions to ask to me. So I was very impressed. Uh, I had not come across uh, such a group of uh, students at this level. So uh, I think uh, I go back highly impressed by that. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, we would like to ask you a question with regard to one turn that took place in your life. You began your career as a literature. What made you turn from literature to tribal domain, sir? See, when we became independent, the Constituent Assembly was formed to uh, frame the Constitution uh, on the eve of independence. And Jaspal Singh, uh, Jaipal Singh Munda, uh, had asked this question, uh, if tribals have to join India, would it be on level playing field, would it be on the condition of equality? And the answer given to him was yes. Now, since then, the government policy towards Adivasis has been either to leave them to themselves, to develop in whichever way they want to, or to determine for them how they should develop. But both these stands were decided by governments. Nobody had asked Adivasis what they want to do, what should happen to them, what was their view. So I thought, if the government was not doing this work, I should do it. Also, at the time I decided this, there was a, there was a surge of uh, violent uh, response to the state among the Adivasis. And I am convinced that um, any social transformation is possible and becomes lasting only if it is founded on non-violence. So for both these reasons, I decided to turn my attention to Adivasis and learn from them what they desire for themselves. Thank you very much, sir. So next question to you. According to you, how has language and literature helped in nurturing diversity as the foundation of Indian civilization? India has had many languages from the very beginning because our land mass is vast different population groups that settled in different parts of the country at different times in the historical uh, past, uh, they developed uh, their own languages. And uh, so uh, the very nature of India is diverse. Uh, it is not like there was one language in India and then many languages were born out of it. Uh, we have to remember that every language reflects the surrounding uh, territory, the ecological conditions, uh, the availability of natural resources, uh, the conditions of light, climate, and so many things. So if people have to be natural in response to their environment, they must do so in their own language, which means in India we must respect all the languages that people speak then only they will become natural citizens of India. Uh, the fact that we have one nation does not mean that everybody in that nation should be like everybody else. Diversity is at the heart of India historically and sociologically and culturally. And we must respect that diversity. I am uh, very convinced of that. Yeah, thank you, sir. Sir, we would like to ask you one question related to our Darjeeling Hills, sir. 
So our people, our especially ethnic communities in the Darjeeling Hills, they are facing identity issues. Would you like to suggest some remedial measures? You see, in our country, the people on the coastal line of India and the people in the hills, in the mountains, these are the two most affected by various development projects. They are also affected by budget imbalances and mostly they are affected by the lack of attention of the country to these two sectors. I can tell you that many communities on the coastal area were forced to migrate to the mainland leaving aside their traditional way of life and their livelihood. Uh, I have noticed that happening uh, to Himalayan states also. I have travelled in uh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. In Uttarakhand more than 70% people have deserted their land and they have gone to Delhi. In Himachal Pradesh despite a small population, they have to migrate long distances to get some respectable livelihood. It is happening to people in Sikkim as well. I see many of them go long, long uh, distances away from their families to get uh, a livelihood uh, of the nature they want. The solution is establishing institutions which become supporting of livelihood in these areas. Uh, when was the first IIT established in any Himalayan state? The answer is this one. When was the first All India Medical Institute established in Himalayan states? The answer is this month. In fact, the Himalayas has a long tradition of understanding uh, ingredients for at least the Ayurvedic medicine, but also the, the, the health management has been a traditional part of the knowledge systems here. I feel sad that an area of the country which provides almost all the water to the country is kept thirsty for development and uh, the communities here uh, deserve a better deal, I am convinced. There are problems. The problems are in our system, the present system of democracy, the representation of communities uh, cannot be sufficiently adequate to the needs of the communities. For instance, uh, UP sends more than 70 representatives to Lok Sabha, but Minikoy sends only one. Now, Minikoy may have I am giving an example. Minikai may have a uh, uh, great ecological uh, emergency. Is the same with Andaman Islands. Is uh, not very different for Goa. Is not very different uh, for Himachal Pradesh or for Ladakh uh, or for a state like Manipur. I think in order to cure the imbalance of representation, uh, we will have to create a system which gives greater importance to the center and the state relations. Now we have those systems in place, but they are not functioning properly, particularly more recently. We have, for instance, the Finance Commission. Which was the last Finance Commission that uh, distributed uh, funds to various states? Uh, there are other imbalances also in the country. The states which contribute maximum to the GST get much less in return from the central government. Which means the central government will have to return once again to the foundational principles of the constitution. And the constitution advocates a federal system uh, which is not competitive federalism. 
it is not not also cooperative federalism it is not cooperation of states in the federal <coughs> unit federal the meaning of federalism is to give maximum where the need is maximum if that happens then small states is a good answer to many of our social evils large states have created overwhelming bureaucracies and therefore the voice of the people does not reach the government at all in small states access to bureaucracy access to political political class is relatively better but for want of material development for want of social development the small states appear to be a liability that picture we have to turn around and uh, the 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 best way to do is to rethink about the way our our uh, finance commission and institutions like that work where a method of providing maximum where the need is maximum providing minimum where the need is minimum has to be developed uh, it cannot be done in an arithmetic way it cannot also be done in terms of people's representation in the lok sabha it will have to be done in terms of available data shared data transparent data honest data today the data is uh, muffled completely it is fudged it is distorted you know that this time even the census has not taken place so we just don't know what the data is what is the population what is the migration what is the poverty level what is the educational attainment in every state the day we get good data transparent data uh, uh, that data will help us so uh, the finance commission the census these are uh, uh, methods created for keeping our democracy alive those method must be allowed to function thank you oh, thank you sir sir uh, another question is based on uh, one of the areas in which uh, you gave your contribution people's linguistic survey of india so sir after spearheading this particular work uh, what were your realizations uh, you see uh, a survey was carried out by george abram greer sir about 100 years ago uh, he started towards the end of the 19th century finished it by 1920s first 30 years 28 years of the 20th century but uh, he had listed 189 languages 544 dialects and so on at that time the <coughs> the uh, map of india was different after independence the map of india is not what the grierson's india was and grierson has not been uh, was not able to do work on uh, many of the southern languages because of the nizam state which did not cooperate so in my case uh, i had uh, i had to look at the uh, a different india for doing the survey in this case of the people's linguistic survey of india uh, one thing i learned and that i would like to share with uh, all the indians of all the times uh, and that is if there is an urgent need that we perceive let us do the work without waiting for the government to do it uh, we did not expect even one rupee from the government without taking even a single rupee from the government i could do this work and complete it the second learning was that between 1961 and 19 uh, and 2011 50 years time india allowed i'm saying allowed 250 languages to die and that's uh, that's uh, almost like it we in uh, for humans we call it genocide for languages i'll call it a phonocide mm -hmm. 250 languages are dead in matter of 50 years uh, is not a good news for any country in 1961 the uh, count of mother tongues in the census was 1652 in 2011 the count of mother tongues in the government data was 1369 
and uh, that is 280 mother tongues had gone down. But out of these 280 mother tongues club together in terms of their independent grammar, their independent history, 250 languages had gone down. So, uh, are we not creating a graveyard of languages? At the same time, I also noticed that there were still, when I did the survey, nearly 850 languages were alive. And for me, it was nothing short of a miracle, uh, considering the conditions in which these languages have remained alive. Uh, I must say that the spirit of the people who speak those languages has to be admired and is a kind of a historical record of sorts. Because despite adverse conditions, most of the languages have continued to live. And that shows the uh, determination and the grit of uh, Indian people. So uh, my, uh, some, my uh, overall response is, the people of India are great and they deserve a great government, which they don't have. Okay, sir. Sir, one more question related to this area. See, what do we, HEIs, higher educational institutions, do in order to preserve this uh, and promote indigenous language or languages? And uh, what are the research perspectives in this area? Uh, SKY, the sky is the limit. One can work on social linguistic aspects of languages. Uh, that is, one can investigate uh, how the languages are used in real life situation and what changes are taking place. Then there one can do research on interlingual situations, how one language mixes with another language, how people are uh, naturally uh, multilingual. The, the third area of research is multilingualism in terms of cognitive faculties. What happens inside the brain to languages? Does the brain look at language as one and another language as second language or does the brain actually mix both these languages and looks at all the linguistic uh, material as a single phenomenon? Uh, these are questions that still need to be answered. There is also the, uh, the possibility of working on language absorption uh, in uh, uh, early age from the uh, uh, from the age of 18 months to the age of three and a half because that's one area in India uh, which uh, uh, which promises uh, very fascinating results before a child enters a kindergarten the child has already mastered either one or in some cases two languages completely. Actually the uh, kindergarten or schools or colleges don't have to teach anybody how to speak, how to understand a language. Uh, uh, in order to make them teachers of language, it is okay to teach them. Now what happens inside the brains of the uh, early you know, infants, uh, uh, child, uh, early childhood, that is one area in multilingual situations needs a great investigation still very fascinating results will come out with reflection on the entire methodology of education in our country there is yet another area of uh, investigation research that is languages in diaspora uh, languages uh, language speakers migrate to many other countries in, in, in India itself, migration has multiplied uh, in the, almost exponential, ex, exponentially uh, during the last 40 years. When people go to other language zones, what happens to the language they had learned back home? How do they retain it? How do they revive it? I know one case where a person had not spoken her or, I mean in this case it was a man, his mother language, mother tongue, nearly for 45 years after migrating out of uh, southern India into United States. But after 45 years a man was able to uh, speak fluently, record the entire language. This is uh, an amazing case. We have many areas of research. 
but most important of all is policy language policy and language management by the state uh, we have policies based on inadequate knowledge of indian languages and we have ma state management of languages based on popular beliefs the state planning uh, mechanisms uh, do not have professional language competence linguistic competence and uh, without that competence decisions are made i'll give you an example when jharkhand was made a separate state uh, 14 uh, languages were declared as state languages but nobody had gone into how this 14 could be retained so funding was made available departments were created in universities out of 14 language departments today jharkhand universities do not have more than five language departments 11 language departments are closed closed now that's a defeat of a sorts so had there been enough competence while declaring the policy they would have created all these departments not at a single timeline in educational trajectory of a child uh, not at the same level but at different level some departments paying attention to primary education some to secondary some to tertiary some to literary productivity some to production of cinema music theater uh, some to actually encouraging uh, that language uh, within the uh, 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 home ecology there are many ways of doing it that was not done. so there are cases when a policy helps a language to retain its life but there are also cases when a policy systematically kills a living language in the name of assistance what is provided is slow death mm -hmm. lot of research is necessary there for us thank you sir sir to wind up our interview we request you to give a message to our scs students faculty and also to the people of darjeeling well for the people of darjeeling i bring love from uh, i have lived in three states maharashtra gujarat and karnataka and i bring i bring to the people of darjeeling immense love affection and friendship we admire you i admire you for what you have been historically and what you are culturally for the students i have no message rather i would like to learn from students because they know much better about the contemporary world and the future world than i do however as an old man who has seen india from 1950 from the year india got its constitution till today i would like to say just one thing do anything and everything that is necessary for keeping our constitution alive in later and in spirit thank you friends you have heard the professor g n devi on behalf of her scs faculty and the entire students including our supporting staff sir i would like to express our sentiments of gratitude to you thank you very much sir for being thank with us thank, thank you, you sir That's thank you very much thank you